Hello and welcome to Pulmonology Read Aloud. My name is Dr. Anshuman Eja Rora. I publish videos on pulmonology and its topics on a regular interval. And if you're new to this channel, I invite you to subscribe and like and share my channel. Today we are going to talk about disease patterns on a CT scan in the chest. Uh, we are doing a CT scan series. We already have two videos. The first one on basics of CT chest, what protocol to be used and the second on how to read lung segments on a CT chest. So today we move one step ahead and we are going to discuss some common patterns on a CT scan. So let's get started. So what are we going to cover today? Today we'll be covering few patterns in interstitial lung disease uh, which include honeycombing, cystic pattern, nodular pattern, ground glass, uh, mosaic and septal thickening shall be covered in the next video. We'll also be discussing about certain patterns in infections like Trinbad and certain patterns that overlap in a malignancy. Let's start with one of the most conspicuous and most prominent patterns that we see on a CT scan in a chest. This is an ILD pattern which is honeycombing. The honeycombing, as the name suggests, resembles the honeycomb that is formed by the honeybees. If you look at it, it is a hexagonal pattern. So it has hexagonal appearance. And if you look at it, that these all hexagonal cysts are touching each other. They share a common lining. And these are diffusely located at one spot. So the honeycombic pattern essentially consists of enlarged air spaces which may be regular or irregular in size. They are in clusters. So they share a thick wall which is visible and they are stacked on each other. Now these cysts vary in their diameter. They can start with 3 mm, go up to 10 mm and the largest of cysts may fuse together to give a bigger cyst. But essentially, they start from the subpleural region and they keep stacking in layers with thickened walls, which are usually uh, the uh, enlarged air spaces and maybe hexagonal in shape. Honeycombic pattern is essentially described in UIP and it is pathognomonic of the UIP pattern in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It usually suggests advanced stage of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It starts in the peripheries, in the bases, subpleural distribution, and sometimes it can be in the upper lobes, especially in sarcoidosis or patients with hypersensitivity pneumonitis. It is also seen in collagen vascular diseases. In fact, in connective tissue disease ILD, exuberant honeycombing, meaning honeycombing which is very predominant and it may cover more than two-thirds of the lungs in very advanced cases and it may abruptly end with a straight line, is also defined. If you look at this lung, you can see these multiple perforations which are nothing but honeycomb cysts. They are formed by dense collagen fibers that destroy the alveolar structures. Now when we talk about UIP and we talk about ILDs and IPF, then another very commonly described sign is traction bronchiectasis. Now traction bronchiectasis or bronchiolectasis is very commonly seen in the UIP pattern. In fact, the presence of honeycombing and traction bronchiectasis is the pathognomonic definition of a typical UIP pattern. However, in an atypical or a probable UIP pattern in ILDs, you may get just traction bronchiectasis without honeycombing. So traction bronchiectasis is also very important to identify. If you look at these series of scans, you can see the honeycomb cysts and you can see dilated bronchi along the path. In this scan also, in this view, you can see dilated bronchi. In fact, it is better visible on this view. And if you see, these are honeycomb cysts and then the dilation of the bronchi. Again, honeycombing on the basis. And if you look at this uh, image, you see honeycombing in the periphery 
these dilated bronchi which are pulling so they are basically dilated airways and these dilated airways are being pulled because of the fibrosis so there's a lot of architectural distortion and whenever there's this pulling because of fibrosis not only the bronchi the bronchioles get pulled but there's also a pull of the pulmonary vessels towards the fibrosis so we see a very dense kind of pull or traction so whenever we look at pulmonary fibrosis in uip we are looking at this honeycombing we're looking at traction bronchiectasis and we're looking at all the architectural distortion caused because of that and that ways we can identify uip i will be doing a separate video on ild patterns and there we'll talk about it again in much detail the third pattern that i would like to describe here is the cystic pattern now what is cystic pattern so cis means air filled spaces so you can actually uh, equate cis to little balloons so if it's a balloon it's an air filled space it should be black in the center right so cystic pattern would look like multiple balloons and since balloons are not thick walled so they will look different from a honeycomb because honeycomb if you remember i said have thick walls so thin walls with air so looking black and they should be well circumscribed so that is what a cystic pattern essentially is thin walled air filled spaces which are well circumscribed if you look at this scan here you can see these punched out thin wall which you can't discern the wall and spaces that are seen and they are circumscribed spaces so this is what a cystic pattern looks like cystic pattern may not involve very small cysts or very large cysts alone it is a pattern of varying sizes so if you look at this scan you can see multiple black areas which are small rounded circumscribed and have thin walls and on the contrary in this scan you can see areas where probably the cysts have merged together coalesced together so they may not look particularly round because there are bigger cysts but again they are thin wall they are not stacked on each other like the typical uip uh, honeycombing and so we can distinguish them as to be cysts again multiple cysts here Uh, in this patient, and they are thin walled. They are not uniformly stacked, but they do not have air. So they are air filled. They do not have any contents here. Here also, you can see thin walled cysts, thin walled cysts. So this is again different from honeycombing. It it is not subplural. These are not a uh, hexagonal stacked on each other, but they are widely spread throughout the lung parenchyma. Now, where do we see these cysts? most commonly when we talk about cystic lung diseases we have few uh, differentials in our mind and as a clinician i do not want to give a big list but i just want to mention the common differentials that we may want to rule out so the first is langerhans cell histiocytosis the second is lymphangiomyomatosis the third is lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia or collagen vascular diseases or infections such as pneumocystis carinae the problem here is that a lot of time we confuse whether these cysts are pathological cysts or this is just emphysema or they are emphysematous cysts so to rule that out let's first see how an emphysematous cyst was will look like so this is the scan which shows centrilobular emphysema now if you look at this centri lobular emphysema also you're able to see certain air spaces uh, certain well circumscribed air spaces that you may see in the lung parenchyma if you look closely then they are discreetly visible but what is different in these cysts as compared to the cysts that we see in the other cystic lung diseases is there is no wall so you can appreciate that there is some black spaces in between but there is no wall so no walls would usually typically happen when you have 
emphysema going on. So it is centrilobular emphysema. So how do we differentiate it? In centrilobular emphysema, you do not have any walls. It is upper lobe predominant. Remember, all smoking associated diseases are upper lobe predominant. And this we will notice throughout the lung patterns. They are diffuse. They are not located at one point and not located at others. Uh, you can't see any opacity in them. You can't see a cyst can be filled with mucus. A cyst can be uh, filled with certain lining. A cyst may have fluid. But central lobular emphysema, you don't see any opacity. They are diffuse. And something that you can very closely look at central lobular emphysema is because it is... Uh, involving the secondary pulmonary lobule, you may see in some cases a dot, a tiny dot or a tiny opacity in the lucency, which is typical of the central lobular artery. So very close look and you may see a central lobular artery in the center of the cysts. But usually, how do we see? They are more diffuse, they are upper lobe predominant, they don't have any walls. So since we're talking about cysts and the first differential that I mentioned in my list is lymphangioliomyomatosis, let's see what lymphangioliomyomatosis cysts look like. So lymphangioliomyomatosis cysts will look like well circumscribed, very round and clear cysts. But what is typical is you can easily see a normal intervening lymph bank gyna. So these cysts will have kind of dots of black cysts surrounded by normal lung panic gyna. And they may be throughout the lung, in the upper lobe, in the middle lobe, in the lower lobe. There is no lobe predilection here. We know that it's more common in females. We, more, we know it's more common in young females, premenopausal. And sometimes you may see associated pneumothorax or spontaneous pneumothorax. Uh, we can also see effusions, which may be chylus effusions, young perimenopausal female coming with uh, premenopausal coming with effusions and these cysts almost confirm the diagnosis is lab. There may be an association of renal angioviva also and the only condition described where it may be seen in males is with the tuberous sclerosis complex. So the way I look at these cysts is black surrounded by white. So you can see a similarity of these cysts with the black and white polka dot. So they may be of different sizes, but they are round, they are very clear, and there is a normal surrounding uh, lung panic guy. The other sort of cystic lung disease mentioned as the second differential is Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Now remember, Langerhans cell histiocytosis is more common in young male patients who are smokers. Since it's a disease affecting cigarette smokers, it should be more in the upper lung. So upper lung predominant and the basis may be normal. What do we find? We find not only cysts here, we also find nodules. In fact, they start as nodules and they become cysts. So some patients you may find both cyst and nodules, some you may find only nodules, some you may find cysts. So nodules and cysts, upper lung of a smoker, with very, very high satinity, we could say that the diagnosis is Langerhans cell histiocytosis. But to me, if you look at these cysts, what do they look like? They look like cysts with a rounded margin with a wall, cysts that do not look like very uniformly shaped, right? And they are thick walled, they are irregular. And as compared to the beautiful polka dot of a lamb, these cysts to me look quite angry looking. In fact, if you look here also, you see that these are cysts which look more ominous in nature. And they have a thick wall. In a lot of these cysts, you may see a thick wall. So, if you try to get a comparison, if you look at it, maybe it's good to remember that a smoker with a cigarette butt and a cyst caused by a cigarette butt 
could be something which you can use as an example in your mind to remember the cis in Langer Hansel histiocytosis. The third differential I mentioned was of lip or lymphocytic interstitial lymphonitis. Now, as I said, I might discuss it again in ILDs, but for reference, because we are dealing with cysts right now, if you look at lymphocytic interstitial lymphonitis, which is a kind of an ILD, you will see round cysts, but they are very well circumscribed with a circumferential wall. Now, unlike the other cysts of upper lobe protuberance, they are seen more in the lower lung and these are very commonly associated with masses, maltomas and lymphomas. So, round cysts, circumferential wall, lower lung, high incidence of malignancy associated, also very frequent with autoimmune diseases like Sjogren's syndrome, with rheumatoid arthritis, with SLE, with polymyositis or lymphomas, these cysts are cysts of LIP, lymphocytic interstitial lymphonitis. And you'll notice they're not as diffuse as the cysts we've seen earlier, but they are with the circumferential wall and quite discrete cysts that are visible. The last differential that I mentioned in the cysts was of pneumocystis pneumonia infection. Clearly, this is more aggressive, more severe, acute presentation in patients. You will see a lot of ground glassing, a lot of ground glass opacities along with cysts. And these cysts may be expanding pneumatocele. So you are seeing a cyst at one time and if you follow up this patient, it may big, form a big pneumatocele as well. Otherwise, if this patient doesn't have a pneumatocele as such, you look at the cyst, to begin with, they may be very, very tiny and thin-walled. And some of them in between might start becoming thicker in wall and then they may form pneumatocele. You may have multiple cysts or you may have few cysts. You may have multi-lobulated cysts also. But whenever you have a cyst and ground glass opacity in an immunocompromised patient, the nemocystis pneumonia may be a strong differential. Now the other pattern that I'm going to take in this video is of nodules. When we move on, through the nodules, uh, I'm going to stop this video and we will follow up with another video uh, which will discuss about ground glass, septal thickening and other patterns. So nodules, nodules can be seen in varying forms. Nodules can occur in various distributions. So let's divide the nodules on the basis of the distribution. Nodules can be Perilymphatic, they may be random, they may be centrilobular, or they may be bronchovascular. And if you look at this division, this beautiful algorithm taken uh, from this article, if it involves the pleural surface, then they could be perilymphatic or random or diffuse. And if they do not involve the pleural surface, and they could be centrilobular, they could be tree in bud, they could be bronchovascular also in the center. So nodules can be divided based on their site of appearance. Let's start with perilymphatic nodules. When we try to understand the distribution of perilymphatic nodules, it's important important to remember that the lymphatic supply in the lung starts in the subpleural region and then along the bronchovascular bundles the lymph is drained and then it ultimately comes to the hilar nodes or the various nodes. So it starts in the periphery, it goes to the center towards the nodules. In our clinical practice, the most common cause of nodular perilymphatic bronchovascular patterns is sarcoidosis. Having said that, there are many more causes for this pattern. Let's try to see what kind of pattern it is. So perilymphatic nodules typically appear in this drainage system. So from the first figure now, it's easier to understand that either they would be subpleural 
or they could be across the bronchovascular uh, bundles the lymphatic bundles along the fissures and these appear in a very beaded fashion so if you look at these images you can see these nodules some are subplural and look at this beading of the nodules again in this picture it looks clearly beaded so nodules which are subplural which are extending in a beaded fashion towards the nodal system they are usually perilymphatic nodules and what i like to equate them to is a beaded necklace so if you remember this then these nodules will also look like small little beads on a string and very very typically seen in sarcoidosis otherwise as i said the nodules may be randomly located in the lung or they may be located in the centrilobular region single or multiples called centrilobular nodules and this bead of strings would be our perilymphatic nodules so sarcoidosis you would see in stage 3 sarcoidosis perilymphatic nodules in subplural fissural perilymphatic bronchovascular bundles in a beaded fashion they may be 1 to 5 mm sometimes they are also larger but usually typically described in this fashion the other kind of nodule is the random nodule so random nodules are very commonly described in occupational lung diseases diseases like silicosis or coal workers pneumoconiosis in tuberculosis fungal diseases see wherever uh, we are thinking of tuberculosis fungal also usually comes hand in hand uh, in the differentials and metastatic nodules can also be randomly distributed so let's look at this these images the first one is from a patient with silicosis and the second one is from a patient with miliary tuberculosis they are both taken from the net they are not my patients now silicosis nodules if you see they are apollo predominant they may or may not involve the pleura but usually the pleura is paired so we would like to say that pleural involvement in these nodules is usually not there usually is paired or less common and the dominant pattern in these nodules is random there is no particular area where you can see them they are not specifically around the bronchovascular or the lymphatic bundles or the fissures and later on sometimes these nodules can coalesce and they can start looking bigger like a mass lesion when we start calling them as progressive massive fibrosis so then they become mass like so they would usually stay uh, asymptomatic initially and then they become symptomatic when they become a mass like pmf so these are typical of silicotic nodules the miliary tb nodules on the other hand they are more subtle they are more diffuse they're also random and if you look at it you really have to see very hard through it to identify these small nodules but they are uniformly extensively distributed throughout the lungs another form of nodule which is random is the metastatic nodules so metastatic nodules have been typically described as cannon balls so cannon ball appearance can happen because of these nodules which may be random some may be subplural some may be in the center some may be along the bundle some may be bronchogenic uh, so it is quite distinct and they are random and so this patient has a cannon ball metastasis here and the second image that you see is of papillary carcinoma thyroid metastasis in the patient both the cases you see very well circumscribed nodules sometimes tiny as in this case or i would say tiny rather smaller or very large very conspicuous uh, so they vary in size but they are random 
Coming to the other common type of nodular pattern, it is centrilobular nodules. And centrilobular nodules, as we can see, they involve the secondary pulmonary lobule. So this is the secondary pulmonary lobule, the hexagonal subpleural space, which is the smallest unit which is visible on a CT scan, which has uh, a central pulmonary artery, which has a bronchiole, and the nodules here, if they are present, then you can appreciate they'll be equidistant. So they will be equidistant nodules from each other. Here also, nodules are equidistant because they are across each central secondary pulmonary lobule. So these are called centrilobular nodules. So centrilobular nodules, they are equidistant usually, they are symmetrical in terms of involving various secondary pulmonary lobules and the most common conditions where we see secondary pulmonary uh, the centrilobular nodules is hypersensitivity pneumonitis and respiratory bronchiolitis. Now, why is this so? Because if you acknowledge that the secondary pulmonary lobule consists of the central pulmonary artery divisions and the bronchioles, and so if there is any opacification of this because of inflammation, because of fluid pass, then we can see them as nodular prominences. So this is a case of hypersensitivity neuritis. You can see that there are hazy ground glass nodules. So they are not solid nodules, but they are ground glass, but they are equidistant. So they are involving the secondary pulmonary lobule, they are centrilobular nodules, and because they are hazy, they are sometimes difficult to identify as compared to the typical nodules. But in hypersensitivity pneumonitis particularly, you may see along with these nodules the triple density sign where you get the ground glass opacities of high attenuation which are the nodules. You also get a mosaic attenuation pattern and you get a normal lung in between. We will be describing this again in the ILDs. So, however, they are ground glass nodules. And this is also typically described as or was described as the head cheese sign. But now it's called the triple density sign. Presence of three different densities in the same scan where you can see a different density. Right? And that is what is typical of HSP. So another form of centrilobular nodules which are uh, which are shown is the centrilobular nodules in respiratory bronchiolitis. So respiratory bronchiolitis is a very common differential diagnosis here and usually seen in young smokers. Uh, there may be upper lobe, in, upper lobe involvement, there may be ground glassing in the nodules and they're usually ill-defined. So Sometimes it is seen in infections, infections most commonly like viruses, respiratory syncytial virus causing bronchiolitis obliterans or mycoplasma infection or viruses. Uh, usually in children, infectious bronchiolitis occurs because of RSV and in adults there may be cellular uh, or infectious bronchiolitis but usually it is secondary to infections. And certain infections like tuberculosis will become more chronic or atypical mycobacterial infection also. You may see a uh, bronchiolitic pattern in the form of nodules. In an immunosuppressed patient, if you're looking at similar nodules, then you may see fungal infections also, which can produce this similar appearance. So basically, you will see uh, a lot of inflammation which is going on in the bronchioles and because of that these nodules are visible uh, sometimes they are associated with other patterns with ground glass with consolidations with treat bud and uh, how do we differentiate these from hsp nodules is that they are usually hsp nodules are usually diffuse poorly defined and ground glass they don't have a soft tissue attenuation and uh, there is also mosaic attenuation and air trapping which helps us distinguish an HSP nodule from respiratory bronchiolitis. These are some examples of centrilobular nodules in respiratory bronchiolitis. You see air trapping, 
you see that uh, there is subtle nodular pattern but th there's a lot of air trapping here you can appreciate the nodules in a zoomed up image here in this patient and mycoplasma pneumonia is a very common cause of this kind of pattern the other pattern which uh, is akin to the central lobular nodules is treed bud pattern it is actually characteristic of a small airway disease so if you look at this image you can identify that it looks like a branch of a tree a budding tree so so these buds these little buds arising they are actually bronchial dilatation this is filling by mucus by pus or by fluid and this starts resembling a tree you may see a little small nodules along these branches and most commonly they are more pronounced at the periphery of the lung and they are associated with abnormalities of the airway so normally when you look at the airways you cannot identify less than 1 mm but uh, only more than 2 mm diameter uh, bronchi can be visible but when they are diseased when they have fluid then they may be visible and in the form of a tree in bud pattern and it's indicative of a spectrum where you have an endobronchial disorder or a peribronchiolar disorder where there's bronchial wall thickening, there's dilatation, there's inflammation, there's mucoid impaction or pus impacted or fluid. Typically, it is described with mycobacterium tuberculosis of endobronchial spread, but treatment pattern is very well recognized now as a pattern of small airway disease, as a pattern of other infections, even fungal, viral, parasitic, in certain disorders like obliterative bronchiolitis, pan bronchiolitis, and aspiration, some connective tissue disorders, some pulmonary emboli, and vascular diseases also. So, if you know the pathology, you can correlate that treatment is not only mycobacterium TB, but this is why it happens because of either bronchiolar wall thickening or peribronchiolar inflammation or luminal impaction. So this is the typical treat bud pattern, most commonly seen in periphery. You can see, you can see this branch and then you can see little buds coming from it. So here also you can see the branch and you can see little buds coming out of it. This is what treat bud is described as. Another pattern is the bronchovascular nodules. Uh, one of the very common examples is lymphangitis carcinomatosis and lymphoproliferative disorders so usually it has a, a prominent pattern of networking or it has this nodules along the bronchovascular bundles it's also commonly seen in Kaposi sarcoma in HIV patients in the periphery uh, it can also be seen in sarcoid patients but you'll see beaded nodules along the fissures in the subpleural region also sometimes in infections as well but uh, whenever you see these nodules along the bronchovascular bundle, uh, these are the common differentials that have to be kept in mind. So this is all for this video. I'm going to soon make another video which will deal with ground glass pattern, mosaic pattern, uh, thickenings, ILDs and other things that I may have missed out. Uh, do connect with me by writing a message in the comment box about what you would like to see in more of the videos. Happy reading and bye-bye from Pulmonology Read Aloud.